start recording stuff. All right. Uh, f- actually, first, who had the torsion lab yesterday? How did it go? Good. Everything worked out. Because I saw I saw Serwin sent out an extra lab set or an extra data set. It was slipping, and so the ah. data that we got. Yeah. 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 So we. Um, yeah, I guess we're the same so he said that he just kind of recorded data, put the data sets online, and then we went through the, like, the steps in there, and then we're just using the online data set for analysis. Okay. So the second, or the 4 p.m. lab didn't slip, and the 2 p.m. 2.30 did? Okay. So hopefully he got the kinks worked out. I know that setup can be kind of difficult. you got to really crank it down to make sure things don't slip, especially for the steel. Okay. That's kind of what I figured. But... Good to hear that it went smoothly otherwise. All right, so uh, let's talk about torsion. Let's finish up our discussion on torsion. Torsion. So we had defined a couple things yesterday for a bar that's being torqued. If I have some uh, torsion being applied, T, I guess uh, this isn't an axis here. I shouldn't draw that as an actual force. For a bar that's being torqued with some force T, uh, if it rotates by some angle theta in here, that doesn't look like anything, uh, some angle theta, we say that it has some outer radius R naught, some length L. Uh, yesterday we went through the elastic deformation, and we said there's some shear now, in the elastic range, some shear gamma, and that gamma is theta r over L, which we get using a small angle approximation, and we say the shear stress is related to torque, or torque is related to shear stress. Let's draw this, uh, I'll do it this way, as uh, tr <coughs> over j, where j is that uh, polar moment of inertia. So these were the couple equations that we'd given in the elastic regime. Uh, torque is also related to, and we, we get this by integrating along our surface. We say this is g theta, so this is also g theta r over L. And we got that by looking at our cross section, <coughs> drawing an infinitesimal ring of some thickness dr here dr and integrating the the shear and the torque shear and torque uh, to relate that shear to a torque and so today uh, or then I guess we got to what happens when this bar starts deforming elastically so that's what you'll be doing in this lab and I'll, I'll go through an example for that we said that you can figure out basically the the radius of yielding so so in the center of the bar because both of the both the shear and the stress are related to torque and twist uh, linearly with R there's no yielding at the very center there's no shear at the very center uh, and the maximum shear and uh, strain and stress are on the outer edge and so we can figure out where uh, once the outer edge of the bar starts yielding and that yield surface starts moving in we can figure out what the yield radius of this material is uh, as tau yield L over G theta. So we can figure out how far in that yield surface has moved. So now I want to figure out, so I, I, I related torque to shear in the elastic range. I want to now figure out how torque relates, or shear stress relates to torque in the plastic range. And to do that, basically we start off with that same sort of analysis, uh, except now we break our torque into an elastic and a plastic part, plastic, uh, in that elastic range, I say, so I'm still doing the same sort of integral that I did for the elastic, uh, elastic range, but now I say inside this elastic range, I have some uh, tau 2 pi r dr, uh, tau elastic 2 pi r uh, squared dr, uh, and then in the plastic range, I have some Ry to 
r naught, which is my outer radius of tau plastic 2 pi r squared dr. And so now the exact relationship between torque and shear is going to depend on what model I'm applying for my plastic shear. So in this elastic range, I can still say that this is my g theta r over l. Here, I, I don't know necessarily what relationship to use for plastic shear. And so what I can do uh, is take that plastic shear to be, so I, I can assume some sort of a, a hardening or softening or, or elastic, perfectly plastic model. For the lab and for most metals, we're gonna assume some sort of a hardening model. So for that now uh, in your uniaxial test, so this is now what's gonna be the extra credit for this lab. Uh, we said that uniaxial stress is related to axial strain based on some hardening coefficient uh, and some hardening exponent, or some, some coefficient and some hardening exponent. And so the extra credit for this lab is figuring out what this relationship is for the two tests you had done on two weeks ago now uh, for the tension test. Uh, actually, for one for the aluminum that you had done and one for the for a different type of steel, it's 1018 steel, so the TAs gave you, or Serwin had given you data for the 1018 steel tension. Um, and so you can figure out what these H and N are uh, from uniaxial tests, but the TA will give you va some values for them for the, for the torsion test. We can say now, based on an equivalent stress relationship, that that torque is related to stress as the, based on the square root of three, uh, and that the gamma is related to shear strain based on the based on the square root of three relationship, or sorry, uh, switch that around. Strain is related to gamma based on the square root of three relationship, which uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail explaining right now. I give it a little bit in the notes, but um, just take it as it is right now. But so now I can I can define my shear stress as uh, that square root of 3 tau is equal to h gamma over square root 3 to the n, or uh, my shear stress in the plastic regime is equal to some coefficient over square root 3 uh, gamma over square root 3 to the n. These are these square roots of threes are technically constants, and so I could just factor them into this h coefficient. And the reason I'm not is just because here I'm getting that h and n from a uniaxial tension test, and so to relate it to that uniaxial tension data, I, I have to have these square roots of three in there. So now, in the elastic regime, I can say that gamma. Let's make sure I'm not mixing things up here. Um, so gamma is still my g theta over r. Uh, let's do this on a new page. There we go. So now I guess for both of these I, I'm still use that gamma is g theta over r relationship. Or g, g theta over r. Uh, r theta over l. I don't know where I'm getting a G in there. R theta over L, or uh, tau is G R theta over L. There we go. That's where that G was supposed to come in. Uh, and now my torque, I can write out as the integral from zero to the yield strength, G theta uh, over L. I'm going to bring this R to pi r cubed dr for my elastic regime plus the integral from r yield to r naught of this is now 2 pi h over square root 3 uh, this is now a g r theta over l square root 3 to the n r squared dr so it's this kind of big, ugly integral. 
I can pull some stuff out. A lot of this is constants. Um, I can say this is now 2 pi g theta over L integral from 0 to ry r cubed dr plus 2 pi h g to the n theta to the n over uh, square root 3 3 or 3 to the n over 2 <coughs> 3 to the n over 2 plus 1 half oof, plus uh, L to the n integral from R y to R naught of R to the 2 plus n dr oh that's a big ugly thing it's getting uglier by the minute okay so if I plug all this stuff in uh, what I what I can do is is find now my elastic component and my plastic component of stress this is that elastic this is that plastic uh, and find those to be my elastic component is just uh, g theta pi over 2 r yield to the fourth uh, over L which is also just tau pi over 2 r to the fourth over r and my plastic component is uh, this is going to be a big ugly thing 2 pi h over square root 3 n plus 3 theta over L root 3 to the n r naught to the n plus 3 minus r y to the n plus 3 <sighs> and then I could relate this back to my shear but I'm going to leave it in relation to my twist so <laughs> that's a whole lot of stuff uh, and a whole lot of big equations. In practice, what this means for your lab is what you're going to be doing, you're, you're, for those of you who did it, you now have seen, you're going to take a rod and be applying a twist angle to it and measuring out a torque. So you experimentally, you're applying some theta, measuring some T, but then that T is T elastic and T plastic. So you basically have to f determine from the applied twist what the elastic and plastic portions of your torque are. So in this, G is a constant, L is a constant. Uh, the yield radius you can calculate based on the applied twist from here. So our yield radius uh, tau y is a material parameter, constant material parameter, theta, so theta is the only thing determining your yield, uh, your yield, radius of yield. Uh, so then you can figure out your radius of yield, uh, what the stress in the body is, which is just varying axially with your applied twist, and then how that varies across the radius. Um, and then here, these are all constants, these are all constants, theta is being applied, this is a constant that's measured from so now these are all one big function of theta so both of these um, both of these you can calculate directly from whatever your theta is and so in the data we now will give you an H and an N will you'll be applying that theta and you'll be telling us what the elastic and plastic components of your torque are and trying to relate that to the torque that you're measuring, or trying to relate that analytically to the torque you're measuring out. Cool. So that's torsion plasticity, which is fun, 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 fun stuff. So I'm going to ask a couple first uh, questions or thoughts about that. If not, I have a couple of conceptual problems that I'm going to throw, or one conceptual and one numerical I'm going to throw at you. I just talked a whole lot. 
and threw some cross derivations up. Yeah. Is this, uh, this is not. Yeah. Um, torsion plasticity is kind of a, a niche subject that, again, most of the time people would do an easier test to measure shear, but because I think this is an interesting lab to do and a fun analysis to do. Uh, I'm having you all do it. And, uh, yeah. Uh, there's one more question. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So are those derivations of T elastic and T plastic valid for an arbitrary rod and torsions? Uh, sort of. So you would, you would still integrate over the area. So the, you would still have some, uh, some elastic and some plastic shear strain, shear stress relationship, shear stress, shear strain relationship, but then these integrals would change because you would be integrating over the area instead of, of, of say, like a square instead of a circle. Um, so this was done assuming that I'm taking a, a polar or oh, okay. integral. So those equations will work for, say, the tension lab or the torsion lab, rather. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is exactly what you'll need for the torsion lab. Oh, fantastic. Like this, the yeah, set of, that was my question. Yeah, yeah. This set of equations is, is directly for the torsion lab, awesome. which is why I'm going through this derivation. You could do a similar type of derivation if you had, say, a square rod that you were twisting, but it would change up a bit. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Huh? Uh, N is that... Hardening exponent. Hardening exponent, and then H is just a hardening coefficient. Yeah. Are those given, or are those, is there another equation you used to calculate that? Or so that is from your uniaxial tension test. You have that elastic and then hardening portion. So in there, this hardening data, you would fit, so this, this is uh, sigma equals uh, E epsilon. And then all in this range, sigma equals h epsilon to the n. So once it starts deforming plastically, this is where that fits in. Um, although technically you have to calculate it using true stress and strain. But this is why, so we're giving you values for h and n to use, but you can recalculate them yourself from the tension data. From the previous lab. And the TA, well, from the aluminum for the previous lab and the steel is 1018 steel instead of 836 so the TA gave you data for 1018 steel and tension. Would we evaluate our previous lab just for fun or is this like a recording part of the lab? That it, we it's an extra calculate? extra credit. Oh, it's extra credit. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we're not expecting you to do it but if you want, I think it's like 5%. Yeah. Okay. Just for kicks. There was a... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, say that again? So, the aluminum from the tension class, we'd only be able to do this for that, right? Because we used it as the The TA is giving you 1018 steel tension data. Oh, tension? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you can do it for both of them. But you could use your data for the for the aluminum. You would have to use the provided data for the steel. So there could be like more instructions on what exactly to do for the two kind of data when that happens, or are we just like to do it from this information? Uh, not necessarily from this information, but you can look up how to do power law fittings to this. I, I think you can ask the TA, he'll probably explain it in the recitation, okay. but he would be the one to, to talk to about how to actually go through it. And you said that we should be using our true stress strain curves for this yes. information? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we use true stress strain for all of these equations? Uh, for the power law coefficients here. Okay. Yeah. These are defined in an engineering sense. So we use true stress and strain to find sigma equals h even at n, but then you're saying that we use engineering when we plug it into the equation. Yeah. Because we're assuming that so the when you have this torsion test being done, there's no geometric instabilities. So there's no necking in the material, there's no localization of the strain, so it still works for torsion. Yeah, or it like works approximately well enough. It's still, it's still a model, 
it's not your data isn't going to fit a perfect power law coefficient anyway but this is just an, an estimation of what the material is doing you could theoretically do an elastic perfectly plastic material and do the same derivation except say the tau plastic is just tau yield as a constant value which I'll show for the bending tests or for bending plasticity um, but for this lab it makes more sense to assume that the material is hardening actually going to throw a numerical problem at you. So it might help to have a calculator or something on your phone. The numbers are simple enough that you should be able to do them in uh, on uh, on paper or without too much problem, but I'm still going to throw them. So uh, the question is, I have a rod that's one meter long and I'm twisting it by uh, one radian, so a little bit less than six degrees. Uh, it has a yield strength of 200 MPa, a shear modulus of 100 GPa, and the question is, has it yielded after that first twist? And then if we triple that twist, has it then yielded? Screwy. It was, yeah. Yeah, Take about 30 seconds, talk it through with your neighbors, assuming you've been able to get on the pole everywhere. together. So it looked like so it looked like most people had that it didn't yield in the first one and did yield it in the second one. 
who wants to try to explain why they got that answer? No volunteers. Okay. Yeah. He did it a different. He did it a different way. He solved for R Y. Okay. And for R Y, you got that. If what solving for R Y. Yeah, so those are both perfectly valid ways to, to look at it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna show the second one because because I think I want you to be thinking about the yield surfaces that way. But yeah, so you can you can directly calculate wherever things are um, the shear stress from the g theta over r applied twist radius and see if it's past the yield strength. Um, but graphically, what what I want you to think about is that you have some circle of some radius and you have a yield radius that's closing in as you as you apply greater shears. So if I if we plug stuff in, we have that 200 times 10 to the 6th pascals, 10 100 times 10 to the 9th pascals, 1 meter, 1 radian, uh, which ends up at 2 times 10 to the minus 3 meters or 2 millimeters. So the yield radius initially we have a radius of one here, uh, and then it, our yield radius is two. So the yield radius is somewhere bigger than our circle. If I then uh, triple that here, uh, so I say this is now 200 uh, over two, two millimeters over three radians instead, uh, then that would go to two thirds of a millimeter, which then lives somewhere inside of this circle. And as you continue to apply greater and greater amounts of twists, that yield surface gradually approaches uh, the an infinitesimal point on the sample. But there's always, you always have some point in the center where technically the material hasn't started to yield plastically yet. So at the very middle, because you have that one over theta relationship, you can keep twisting and twisting and twisting. And there's always some small center point in the uh, along the exact neutral plane that wouldn't have yielded. Cool. So in your lab this when we ask you to calculate a yield radius for every for every applied twist, this is kind of what we're asking you to think about. Um, and then you use that along with or you use that theta and the yield radius to determine what your elastic and plastic components are. Okay. One more conceptual question for pull everywhere stuff. This one's going to be open ended. You're not seeing the questions? It just says that you're in your presentation, the easiest pie, as soon as there's a question, it'll show up here. Try and reload. Yes. Now it's giving the blank screen. Uh, is that giving you now the old question? This is now the old question? This is, is this the new question now? Still point. You can use the text function. Oh yeah, respond with keyword. Sorry, I just totally screwed everyone else up. Everyone else 
I have no idea why Polaroid's being screwy. Is anyone else having issues getting access to the question? Yeah, I'm not sure. So this would be looking for, uh, I guess, just the maximum shear stress in the, or the shear stress everywhere in the sample, but. But the sample is as a yielding section and a elastic section. Yeah. Okay. In the plastic regime, because okay. there's always an elastic and a plastic something in there. are doing because I don't <laughs> see any responses up there other than my so, so it's Paul everywhere just being weird. It's not pulling here. So it's, it's not pulling it. <laughs> it's pulling everywhere but here. Yeah. Pull everywhere else. Yeah. Uh, okay. Cool. So let's <clears throat> let's bring it back together. <laughs> Who wants to talk about what they think is happening to the shear stress in the elastic and plastic regime. If you double the twist, or double the tw double the torque. So we have those big, long, gross equations for things. There we go. So we have these big, long, gross equations for uh, the tau yield and the, uh, the, the elastic and plastic, or shear in the plastic regime related to torque. Here, if it's just deforming elastically, yeah, it just doubles. Here, uh, you could actually get to a point where you're not able to double at all. So 
what you will end up seeing when you start plotting your data uh, for twist versus torque is you'll see something like this happening and the the torque will start to plateau as you plastically deform your material and that plateauing will be exacerbated by the fact that even though your material is hardening so even though you have this um, elastic uh, hardening behavior because more and more of the sample is deforming plastically as you as you continue to apply twists you'll get a weaker and weaker torque response out and so sometimes you can't even actually apply twice the torque because the bar just can't support it if it's started to deform plastically um, so yeah the, it's it's hard to say what happens if you double torque and even if you can double torque so it's a little bit of a trick question but good answer yes how would you go about analyzing the formula to come to that conclusion <coughs> so if you wanted to actually relate it to torque you would have your torque elastic <coughs> torque plastic and if you <coughs> doubled the torque here you would be contributing to both elastic and plastic but now that torque is no longer linearly related to shear stress. Or that torque is no longer linearly related to shear. So you could replace um, replace your tau back into your plastic yielding equation, which isn't particularly useful for the experiment that you're going to be doing. Um, but and you can't necessarily measure that shear stress out uh, unless you sort of the throw strain gauges on that? Actually, no. I think it would be very difficult to experimentally measure the shear stress at all um, for that type of a loading situation. Yeah, so it, it, what you're going to get out is that torque twist relationship, and you'll find that at a certain point you just can't apply more torque. It's going to start to just kind of level off. Cool. So, uh, on Friday, we'll have Serwin go through a recitation for the lab. Are there any questions on torsion or the lab before we move on to beam bending, plasticity and bending? Cool. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about plasticity in beams. Great, we have about 10 minutes left. So we had talked a little bit about this before, I think like two weeks ago, before we actually got into midterm stuff. But uh, what I want to find out now is if I have a bar in bending, do, do, do. Some load applied. I have some effective moments in the beam, uh, and I'm looking at shear stress distributions. Uh, this is now along my z direction, and this is my x direction. The shear stress or the axial stress varying with z um, depends on what my moment is, but it varies. Uh, linearly across the beam in the elastic regime or we gave you a definition that this varies elastically across the beam or varies linearly across the beam in the elastic regime um, now I want to go through a slightly more formal proof of this and then a check to see what happens when we start to when our, our maximum stress sigma starts to hit our yield strength of the material. So what happens when it starts to plastically deform? So there's one main assumption that I'm going to carry through in this analysis, and that's that the strain in the beam varies linearly. So that no matter what my uh, what the applied load is, let's go that way. Uh, strain going out. This is going to be a strain. Uh, sorry, strain with respect to Z, strain with respect to Z, 
even if I pass the yield strain, I still have some uh, linear deformation, linear strain across the bar, and that this profile isn't going to change. And I'm going to make this assumption based on my plane strain or plane sections remain plane assumption for Euler beams, um, which is going to make this analysis work out. Uh, so then for that, if I have some arbitrary height z, uh, I'm going to call this c, which for uh, c is max distance from center, which is just h over 2 for a beam of height h, um, but I'm going to use c for convenience here. I can say that some random epsilon at some height z is equal to the maximum strain of the beam at that maximum distance away, and that this, so it, it varies linearly in the beam re regardless of where I'm at relative to the neutral axis. So with that assumption, <coughs> let's go and set up the elastic part of this really quick, and then tomorrow we'll go through the plastic bending cases and then start getting into buckling, start getting into buckling. So bending, what I'm going to do to set up this problem is basically the same thing that I had done uh, with the torsion case. So I want to figure out how my shear, how my stress relates to my bending moment. I know my bending moment is some force times a distance uh, based on that definition of bending moment similar to a torque but now the force that I have uh, is the stress that's acting in this thing. So I have some infinitesimal slice of a beam dz that is some distance z away from the neutral plane of the beam. Say this is a beam of, of base b and height h there we go. These are all very small. I apologize for that. Um, and I want to say now if I if I have some stress in the beam, some stress, I want to integrate over that uh, through the beam to figure out what my moment is. So I can say my moment relates to my stress uh, by integrating from negative c to c or negative h over 2 to h over 2. So this is distance from the neutral plane. Uh, my sigma or my, my force now. So force is sigma times the area, which is going to be the width times the infinitesimal height. So B dz. Uh, and then the distance away from the neutral plane is going to be a z. So I have this, it's, this is now some stress sigma acting on this infinitesimal slice B dz, some distance z away. And I'm going to integrate that over the z, um, over z. Now I need to figure out what my stress is. So in the elastic regime, I'm going to say stress is equal to uh, E epsilon, which, yeah. Well, sorry. I guess that z would come out. Um, yeah, there's just one z, or one dz. Would you integrate over z? Yeah, we're integrating over we're integrating over z, but that that's the yes. So this would then come out here if I were to reorganize this properly. C sigma b z d z. But the the way that I'm setting it up, this is that force component. This is the distance. So I'm just making it look confusing on the on here. So I know that my stress in the elastic regime is related to my strain by E epsilon. I know that epsilon, I can say, is whatever the maximum strain is in the body times Z. So this is E epsilon C Z over C. So now my moment, I can say, is the integral from negative C to C of E epsilon C, which is just the max strain over uh, B over C, Z squared DZ. Uh, and I'm going to pull in a relationship now, my area moment of inertia, so that I, which is equal to the integral of 
uh, z squared dA or integral of z squared b dz for a constant width beam. So this uh, this term now is at that area moment of inertia. So I can say this now, my moment is E epsilon C over C times I or uh, epsilon C over C. I know epsilon C over C is epsilon over Z, which is sigma Z. So then this is, if I replace stuff, sigma over Z, sigma I over Z, which is that linear elastic relationship I had given before, sigma equals mz over i. So I, when we did beam bending a long time ago, I gave you this relationship. This is where that relationship actually comes from. We assume that the strain varies linearly across the cross section. We take an integral over that area and relate the moment to the stress being applied across that cross section. And we can say that the stress is mz over i. This is now we have an I just coming from that area. So the next step logically would be to break this into elastic and plastic and say that our we have to apply some plastic relationship for our stress similar to how we're doing this torsion thing. So I'll go through that analysis tomorrow. Uh, and yeah, see you then.